Listen only mode. Hi everyone, how are you all? Hope you're traveling okay. Welcome to the ACNC's June webinar where we're going to examine financial reporting and financial reporting requirements for charities. My name's Chris Richards, I'm part of the ACNC's education team. Joining us today is John Aitken, who is part of our hardworking reporting team. Hi John, how are you going? Hi Chris, I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> That's good. Now, um, bit busy at the moment, it's a sort of a busy time for uh, reporting and that sort of stuff, isn't it? That's right, uh, we're coming up to the end of the financial year, so now it's time for charities to think about starting to prepare their financial reports and submitting their annual information statements to the, OC, uh, to the ACNC. Uh, those are generally due for submission to the ACNC at the latest six months after the end of the charity's financial year, unless the ACNC grants an extension of time to submit. Yeah, and we're going to, one of the things we're going to cover in this webinar, uh, due dates, AISs, applying for extensions, lodgements, uh, all those sorts of things. So we'll um, we'll return to that as we get into, uh, get into things today. Before we start, we'll just uh, cover a few of our usual housekeeping points. Um, if you've got any issues with the webinar audio, um, you can have a go at listening through your phone. If you call the number listed in the email, you'll have received upon sign up, um, put in the access code uh, and you can listen to the webinar that way. You can type a question at any time throughout the webinar today. We have Eric and Kat from our reporting team helping us out as well as Matt from our education team. Uh, they're going to be responding in the background to questions and also going to be sending links through to various relevant pages on the ACNC website that uh, crop up during proceedings today. We'll try and answer all the questions that come through if your question isn't answered feel free to send us an email afterwards uh, via education at acnc.gov.au. We'll get back to you. We're recording this webinar too, uh, and the recording as well as the presentation slides will be published on the ACNC website within the next day or so. As always, uh, we'll send an email with website links uh, featured in this webinar out to everyone who's registered, so you don't have to write everything down as we, as we go along. Um, we've also made available a couple of handouts um, today for people who are attending and you can uh, access them as well. Finally, we really value your feedback. If you have any suggestions for ways we can improve our webinars, please let us know in the short survey at the end of proceedings today. Uh, now, let's see, what's on, the, what's on the agenda? He says, switching slides. There we go. Um, what, are we, what are we got on the agenda today, John? Okay, well, uh, here's a quick rundown of some of the general areas we'll be covering. Uh, we'll start with a quick overview of the financial information required from charities filling in their annual information statements, or AISs as we call them. Now, this is something all charities, regardless of size, have to do, small, medium, or large. Uh, so it, it is a good starting point when looking at financial reporting for charities. In doing so, we'll have a quick look at the key records your charity should be keeping, not only to help with its AIS reporting and financial reporting, but also to comply with ACNC requirements. Yeah, and look, of course, uh, medium and large charities, uh, they're obligated to provide some greater detail and information in their financial reporting. Um, this starts with the annual information statement, but really it comes into focus through the greater detail required um, through medium and large charities annual financial reports. So some of the bits and pieces in that context that we'll be covering today is um, looking at some of uh, the information the financial reports need to cover, um, the idea of audits versus reviews, um, some of the new accounting standards that are relevant to uh, the preparation of, of financial uh, financial reports. A, a bit of a rundown and a look at the um, ACNC's recently released report on, uh, which has reviewed uh, charities' annual financial reporting. Um, it's well worth noting some of the bits and pieces that have come out of that. Um, and also just a mention of our, our best practice uh, guide as well on, on disclosures uh, in, in financial reports. Um, just a quick note on the review that I just mentioned before. Uh, one thing it really highlights to us is, is some of the some of the obstacles and some of the issues that charities can run into when preparing their reports. What it allows us to do is identify these issues and then work to help charities address them and avoid them. Um, so throughout the session today, we'll be mentioning some of those things, uh, and of course, this session overall is. 
designed to try and help uh, avoid some of these potholes in the road, I suppose. Um, so a bit of a deep dive into financial reporting. Let's start with the annual information statement uh, and the financial information you'll need to cover there. Um, submitting an AIS is of course a compulsory uh, obligation for the vast majority of charities registered with the ACNC. Contained within the AIS is a significant section that covers financial reporting uh, and financial reporting requirements. Um, the financial information that charities need to submit through the AIS differs to that required um, between, from, between small, medium and large charities. Generally speaking, medium and large charities have greater requirements when it comes to financial reporting uh, and those requirements we're going to focus more heavily on in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, but what we'll do is we'll just give an, a bit of a reminder as to uh, the, the thresholds um, for small, medium and large charities. John, if you wanted to give that bit of a reminder. Sure. So um, the, the reminder here is that the ACNC measures charity size, small, medium or large, based on a charity's total revenue. So charities with the total revenue of less than $250,000 are designated as small. Charities with annual revenue of 250,000 or more, but less than 1 million are medium. And charities with annual revenue of 1 million or more are classed as large. Now, sometimes a large bequest or a similar one-off event may mean that your charity's size changes for just one reporting period. If your charity size uh, changes and you think that your charity is likely to, to return to its previous size in future reporting periods, you can apply for your charity to keep its previous year's size and therefore not have to meet the reporting obligations of a larger charity. Now, there's uh, now it's also worth noting on the, um, oh. on the website too, isn't there, John? That's right, Chris. Yep, and there's an application form you can fill out to apply. Yeah. 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 So look, it's worth noting um, that a public consultation was completed earlier this year as part of a review of the ACNC legislation uh, with a proposal put forward to increase these size thresholds. Mm. Now, it's not law yet, but if, it, if the proposal does become law, the thresholds will become less than 500,000 for small charities and less than 3 million for medium charities for future financial years. So we're expecting an announcement about this to be made very soon and we will publish the details of any announcement on our website and social media as soon as we have more details. Yeah, definitely. Um, we'll, we'll uh, the, the old cliche, keep an eye on, on our website, on our social media um, and we'll make sure that the charities who uh, charities who need to know, which are all of them, um, uh, know and uh, know what the new thresholds are. Um, now, small charities, uh, they have to complete, as it says here, an income statement and a balance sheet by answering questions in the AIS. So, John, what do these questions actually cover? Okay, Chris, well, the income statement covers the income earned and expenses incurred by the charity during the financial year and the net profit or loss when the total expenses are subtracted from the total income. The balance sheet is a snapshot of the charity's financial position at the end of the year, so includes questions about the charity's assets and liabilities, generally what the charity owns and owes. These are these sorts of things, this sort of information, it's, it's stuff that charities should have pretty much at hand, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Charities should be keeping track of all financial transactions. Uh, and there is in fact a legal requirement to keep financial records that correctly record and explain how the charity spends or receives its money or other assets, its transactions, and uh, to correctly record and explain the charity's financial position and performance. So those records will give the charity the information it needs to complete the AIS financial questions and if necessary, a financial report. Okay, so, so what are these records that need to be kept, John? What, what, what are we talking about here? Uh, well, the records a charity uh, will keep will depend on its specific financial affairs. Uh, however, some 
common records uh, include general account books, such as the general journal and general and subsidiary ledgers, cash book records, banking records, including bank and credit card statements, deposit books and check butts, and possibly asset lists or registers. Now the ACNC has detailed information about the types of records a charity should keep and a record keeping checklist on our website. Yeah, and as you can see here, um, we've got a couple of the links here. Again, don't have to scribble them down straight away. Some of them will be getting sent through the chat and obviously we're recording this session as well, so you can refer back to them. Um, we do have our annual information statement checklist that helps you ensure that you have all the information and material and not just financial, but other information as well um, that you need to complete your AIS. Um, we've got our um, AIS uh, guide, um, which helps uh, in the responses to each question in the AIS, helps, you guide, helps guide you through them. Uh, and the record keeping checklist that, that John mentioned, um, that provides a great rundown on the records your charity needs to keep, um, as well as the, the method and, and the form that your charity uh, needs to retain them in. Um, so some key points to remember here when it comes to, to um, AIS lodgement. Um, we mentioned in our introduction about it coming up towards the, I guess, a busy lodgement time with the June 30 due date. Um, it's, that due date is for charities to report on a January to, to December year, isn't it, John? That's right, Chris. The due date for charities that use a calendar year ending 31 December uh, is 30 June, and of course it's fast approaching. Uh, submitting your charity's AIS and financial report before the due date uh, will ensure that the latest information about your charity's programs is available to potential donors, funding bodies, governments, and the public. And it does demonstrate that your charity takes good governance seriously. Now, having said that, if your charity is unable to submit its AIS by the due date, because of circumstances beyond the charity's control, the ACNC may approve an extension of time to submit. Uh, your request for an extension must be in writing and come from an authorized person at your charity. Uh, yeah. In your request, uh, you should tell us the, the reasons for the delay and the new date, uh, due date that you're requesting. And um, you should send your request by email to advice at acnc.gov.au before the AIS due date. Indeed. Um, now, it's also important to, to highlight here that, that small charities also have the option to submit as part of their, AI, as part of their AIS um, a financial report. Now that's a that's an option that's not a compulsion, isn't it, John? Yeah, correct. So medium and large charities have to submit a financial report alongside their AIS, uh, but for small charities, it is optional unless the charity is an incorporated association in the Northern Territory. Now these charities need to provide the ACNC with a financial report that they would normally prepare for licensing NT if yes. they are participating in the streamlined reporting arrangement. So I'm now only reporting to the ACNC. Yeah, and something we really want to emphasize here is that um, whilst for the most part it's optional, the ACNC, we definitely encourage smaller charities to submit an annual financial report. Um, again, we, we, we mentioned accountability and Transparency, John. Um, they're sort of the key reasons why we, why I guess we we ask for this sort of thing. Yeah. So if a charity has already prepared a financial report, then uh, submitting it to the ACNC is a great way to demonstrate a high level of transparency and accountability. By submitting its financial report, a, a charity can provide more detailed information of interest to its stakeholders. Uh, for example, it's specific sources of funding, such as government grants, mm. uh, as well as details of any significant assets or liabilities that would be of interest. Now, it is worth noting, Chris, that last year, over 40% of all small charities voluntarily submitted a financial report with their annual information statement. And that was a figure that, when you mentioned it to me a, a little while back, John, I wasn't aware of. So that was one that came as a little bit of a, a surprise, a, a pleasant surprise, I have to say. Um, it strikes me as a pretty encouraging figure. So 
look to mm -hmm. charities who, who have done this well done um good, good on you um and continue to do so um look small charities also when they're pre preparing their um, financial reports they can choose the type of accounting they use um now they've got a choice between either uh, cash or accrual um john what are the differences or what is the difference between these two types of accounting okay chris so yeah as you said either method of accounting can be used by small charities uh, cash accounting uh, records revenue when money is actually received and expenses when money is actually paid out. Whereas accrual accounting records revenue when it is earned uh, and expenses when they are incurred. Now the timing of these events is often not the same as the time the money is actually received or paid. Uh, one significant difference between the two methods is that cash accounting does not record payables and receivables while accrual accounting does. So cash accounting is most commonly used by very small charities with about 70% of all small charities using this method. And what we see is that as charity revenue increases, uh, we tend to see more charities using accrual accounting and accrual based software accounting systems. Yeah, yeah. Now that we, we've we've had a bit of a look now at, at our uh, the financial reporting information that the charities particularly small charities have had to fill out and, and complete as part of their annual information statement um, we've also had a quick look at our annual financial reporting with with a bit of a reference to small charities registered with the ACNC what we're going to do now we're going to just shift our focus a little we're going to stay with the annual financial reports but what we're going to do is we're going to drill down a little bit deeper and in the context of medium and larger charities um, as we've touched on already annual financial reports provide the public with some extra information um, as well as an extra level of assurance transparency those types of things uh, about charity operations and financial affairs preparing and submitting an annual financial report is is a key way of charities meeting their um, legislative legislative i always have trouble saying that word requirements under the acnc act but more importantly it is it is actually a sign of, of good governance as well so um I guess most charities are going to be preparing some type of financial statement or report as a matter of course each year, aren't they? Aren't they, John? That's right, Chris. Uh, many charities already have a requirement to prepare a financial uh, report uh, to be presented uh, to their members, for example, at their annual general meeting, and that would be a requirement typically in their governing rules or governing document. Yeah, definitely. Now, so when we talk about annual financial reports, what, what do they need to include? Let's let's go through some of the inclusions. Now, as a minimum, medium and large charities must, must provide the ACNC with the following information when submitting their annual financial report. Now, you can see some of them up on the screen in the, in the next couple of slides here. Um, what have we got? What have we got, John? What do, what do they have to cover? Okay, well, uh, first of all, we have four uh, compulsory financial statements, a statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, sometimes called an income statement, mm. a statement of financial position, a statement of changes in equity, and a statement of cash flows. Definitely. And uh, what about these, these three items here, John? Yeah, so to, to supplement the, the final financial statements, um, there's also, uh, charities also need to include notes to the financial statements, which we'll discuss in more detail a bit later. A signed and dated responsible person's declaration about the statements and notes. And for medium charities, either a signed and dated reviewer's report or an auditor's report. And for large charities, a signed and dated auditor's report. Okay, so look, this might sound like a bit, might sound a little bit involved. Um, so what we'll do is we'll offer a bit of an explanation of what some of these elements of an annual financial report are. Um, and look, m many of you might already be familiar with some of them um, as well, but we we'll have a bit of a look now at some of the, the context and, and some explanation. So um, as we see here, what does it mean? Um, what, what are some of these, what, John, what are some of the, I guess the the meanings or some of the definitions of some of these items 
Sure. Okay. Well, um, perhaps we start with the financial statements. The, the financial statements include a, a series of numbers giving important information about a charity's financial affairs. So the balance sheet um, shows a charity's assets and liabilities. Assets are things that the charity owns or possibly things that the charity has control over. And liabilities are amounts that the charity owes. For example, amounts owed to suppliers, GST payable and so on. Ideally, uh, total assets will be more than total liabilities. Yes. The profit and loss or income statement, uh, that shows the charity's income and expenses for the year uh, with material amounts shown individually uh, as well as the net profit or loss for the year. The cash flow statement shows all the cash received and the cash given out by the charity during the year. Uh, the, the cash flow statement is important because it shows how much cash is actually coming into and going out of the charity. Yeah. And finally, the, the statement of changes of equity essentially shows the reserves available to the charity. Now, and, uh, there are, as I mentioned, sorry? No, that's all right. I was going to say, I'll just I'll whiz back a couple of slides and oh. I'll, I'll go to back to oh, this next you. slide yes. here. So, so that's all right. Sorry. Yeah. So regarding the notes to the statements, now these, these provide important information to help readers understand the statements. Uh, for example, they explain the accounting policies used by the charity to prepare the financial statements. Uh, they can include a breakdown of more detailed financial information which supplements the financial statements. And uh, the notes can also include other useful information, uh, for example, a description of any related party transactions. Yeah. Uh, as to the responsible persons declaration, well, this, this document's important. It's a declaration signed by at least one of the charity's responsible persons stating whether or not the charity's financial report meets the ACNC requirements and importantly, whether or not the charity is solvent. That is to say, whether it can pay its debts as they fall due. Yeah. Um, we will, I'll mention here that um, the ACNC actually has a template for that responsible persons declaration. Um, charities can download it from our website, attach it to their financial report. Um, it's easily found on the website. Um, hopefully it can come through in the chat. You can also search for it. Um, if you search for it under responsible persons declaration, uh, you'll be able to access it through there. Also just a reminder that a charity is responsible persons or people. Um, the management committee, board, those sorts of people, they have a duty under the ACNC's governance standards to ensure that the financial affairs of the charity, charity are managed responsibly and to not allow the charity to operate while it is insolvent. So again, um, if you want to have a look and find out some more information about our governance standards, of which you're probably quite familiar, uh, website again, um, acnc.gov.au forward slash governance standards. Um, we go from one standards to another standards here. Um, we're going to look at some of the, I guess, the accounting standards here that, that might influence and might have a little bit of sway over the preparation of some annual financial reports. Um, medium and large size charities need to prepare financial statements uh, and the notes that we've just spoken about, but they have to do it in accordance with Australian accounting standards. John, um, what are these standards? And, and are you able to explain perhaps a little bit more about what they're on about and, and some context? Uh, yes, Chris, uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, those charities are required to prepare their financial reports in accordance with the Australian accounting standards. Now, the, the accounting standards set out a range of requirements for how charities should record their financial transactions and uh, how to report them in their financial statements. The specific type of uh, financial statements and, and what they contain that a charity must prepare and, and which accounting standards they should apply depend first and foremost on whether the charity is classed as what's called a reporting entity. Charities that are reporting entities prepare general purpose financial statements. Other charities that aren't reporting entities prepare special purpose financial statements. All right, now I'm gonna I'm going to ask the dumb question here. What's a reporting entity, John? Okay, well, uh, a reporting entity, it's a term formally defined um, by the Australian Accounting Standards Board. Um, we won't 
recite the formal definition here, uh, but yeah, but generally speaking, uh, if, if people use and rely on your fi charity's financial statements to help them make decisions about how to allocate resources, and they cannot have their information needs satisfied if your charity chose to prepare special purpose financial statements, then your ch charity is most likely a reporting entity. Mm -hmm. Now the ACNC uh, website has more information about reporting entities and of course your accountant or auditor can help you make the assessment of whether your charity is a reporting entity. Okay, now in that definition you've mentioned another couple of elements to financial reports, John, um, special purpose financial statements um, and general purpose financial statements what are these alternatives? How, how do they perhaps differ as well? Um, what, what's the difference between them? Okay, well, um, perhaps first we'll talk about reporting entities and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the contrast. If a charity is a reporting entity, it must submit general purpose financial statements. Now those must comply with all applicable Australian accounting standards. Um, when they submit the, those statements to the ACNC. Yeah. Uh, these charities can prepare full, uh, reporting entities, uh, charities can prepare full general purpose financial statements that include all disclosure notes required by the accounting standards, or they do have the option to include a simplified or reduced set of disclosures in a general purpose financial um, report. On the other hand, if the charity is not, Oh, I was going to say, I was Sorry. going to say the special purpose financial statements, uh, they differ a little bit again, don't they? That's right. So um, for charities that aren't reporting entities, um, they can submit special purpose financial statements to the ACNC, but there are specific requirements for these. Uh, special purpose financial statements must comply as a minimum with uh, the following five accounting standards to the extent they are relevant. So the standards are AASB 101, presentation of financial statements, AASB 107, statement of cash flows, AASB 108, accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors, uh, AASB 1048, interpretation of standards, and AASB 1054, Australian additional disclosures. Uh -huh. Now I should also mention uh, that the ACNC Act requires a charity's financial report to provide a true and fair view of the charity's financial affairs. Now this means that charities should think about whether they also need to apply other relevant accounting standards when preparing their financial statements because generally financial reports will satisfy the true and fair view requirement where all applicable accounting standards are applied. So one good example of uh, a, a potentially relevant accounting standard is the fairly new accounting standard, AASB 1058, income of not-for-profit entities. And look, again, um, we'll just mention here, there's, there's again further information uh, on these different types of financial statements on the ACNC website. You can see the, uh, you can see the link there. Um, so go have a go have a look and 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 uh, I guess have a little bit of a perusal of the, the differences. Uh, again, just as a reassurance, we are also again recording this. Don't you don't have to stress about scribbling down all the AASB standards. Um, it will be included in the recording, obviously, and you'll be able to go back at your leisure and, and refer to them. Um, John, you just also put a, uh, a mention in uh, just a second ago of that new standard uh, 1058. Um, are you able to tell us if there's any other recent changes to some of the accounting standards that charities you know, should be aware of or need to be aware of? Okay, well, uh, there are three new standards charities need to be aware of. And these uh, standards all apply to reporting periods ending 31 December. 2019 and yep. later. Uh, so the first one is AASB 15, revenue from contracts with customers. This standard replaces AASB 118 revenue uh, and has a five-step model for recognizing revenue from contracts. 
The second standard is AASB 16 leases. This standard uh, uh, also has a new approach to leases. Um, what we now see is that most operating leases will be recognized in the charity's um, balance sheet. Most operating leases will be recognized in the charity's balance sheet. Uh, and finally, uh, as the one I mentioned before, AASB 1058, income of not-for-profit entities. And this accounting standard replaces the previous standard AASB 1004 contributions. So these new standards are compulsory where relevant for charities preparing general purpose financial statements and charities preparing special purpose financial statements should also consider whether they need to apply these standards to ensure the statements meet the ACNC true and fair view requirement. Okay. Now there's one more thing too. There's a couple of new requirements as part of AASB 1054, is there, John? That's right. So um, there has been a change uh, to one of the uh, to this standard AASB 1054, which is a compulsory uh, standard for special purpose financial statements. So for reporting periods ending 30 June 2020 onwards, AASB 1054 now requires additional notes in charity financial reports which provide information about compliance with the recognition and measurement requirements in the accounting standards and uh, application of the consolidation and equity accounting requirements in the accounting standards. Okay, now there's again more on the ACNC website. Um, our standards and financial reporting webpage um, includes some answers to some frequently asked questions about accounting standards and about new accounting standards. So look, that's one good place to, to go and have a look. Uh, go, go check out that page, there's the, the address again. Um, and if you're unsure how to apply uh, new the new accounting standard requirements uh, in regards to your charity, well, we would recommend that you discuss this sort of thing with your accountant uh, or your auditor, um, just to just to seek out their their advice and their expertise. Um, now, earlier in the webinar, we mentioned the need for charities to have their financial reports uh, audited or reviewed. This is a general requirement for an, uh, an independent professional to provide assurance that the charity's financial report meets ACNC requirements. Medium charities need to have their reports either reviewed or audited large charities must have their reports audited. So look, auditing and reviewing these reports is vital in ensuring that the reports that are submitted to the ACNC are proper and accurate and they comply with all the standards that are set in place, the standards that we've uh, spent a bit of time talking about today uh, already. Um, what, what happens, uh, John, if, um, if, if things aren't quite right then? Um, if say a review or audit finds that the financial report doesn't meet uh, requirements as, as required, I suppose. Okay, so um, if as a result of the review or audit process, um, the reviewer or the auditor finds that the financial report doesn't meet the requirements of the ACNC Act, or that there were problems identified during the review or, or audit process, then the review or audit report will include information about these issues. Okay, okay. Now, we've got a nice little diagram here. Um, what, what are we seeing on our screen here? This is a bit of a flow chart, isn't it, John? Yeah, so um, I think for, um, for it's worth discussing for medium-sized charities, uh, just, just briefly, to, to talk about the difference between a review and an audit. Um, and there are two main differences. Um, actually, I think if, think if you could move on to the next slide. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Beauty, there we go. Yeah, so um, the, the two main differences are the level of assurance provided uh, and who can actually conduct uh, a review or an audit. Yep. So first to talk about the, the, the process, the level of assurance, the review process will generally be less detailed than an audit and it provides a lower level of assurance. Mm -hmm. uh, in regards to who can conduct an audit or review, well, an audit or review can be conducted by a registered company auditor, an audit firm, or an authorized audit company. 
Having said that, a review can also be conducted by a qualified current member of a relevant professional body, that is CPA Australia, Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand, or the Institute of Public Accountants. So that there's a, for, for a review, there is a broader scope of um, re potential reviewers. Yeah, yeah. And again, there's more information on audit and reviews at the site there that you, or the link there you see on the screen. Um, now our website also has uh, some review and audit report templates that can be downloaded uh, for use as well. So look, there are some handy resources there for you to be able to uh, download and for your charity to be able to use. Um, look, we've gone through details of financial reporting from an AIS process perspective, but also through the annual financial reporting process. Um, we've also looked at what needs to be in annual financial reports, uh, the ideas of say audits and reviews and some of the standards that underpin this, this process. Um, now we know that there's a bit here. Um, again, opportune time to remind everyone that this session's being recorded. You can rewatch it um, at your leisure when we upload it onto our webinar page, uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars. Um, another important part of the process, and this is an important part of the ACNC's educational role here, is how we are able and how we are trying to help charities learn from things that maybe haven't quite gone to plan in the past. Um, this is where our, our annual review of charity financial reports comes into play. Now each year the ACNC analyzes a sample of medium and large charities financial reports. We, we examine some of the issues that have caused some problems uh, in the past as well as I guess in the present. Um, and as well, we've looked at some of the common mistakes that charities have made and, and, and make. Um, there are a few reasons why the ACNC conducts these reviews. We've, we've got them here up on the screen um, at the moment in these lovely looking hexagons. Um, obviously, we do it to check char charities' compliance. That's, that's the basic sort of thing. Um, to check the accuracy of the information they provide us and that information ends up on the ACNC's charity register, so that's important too. But importantly, it also helps us identify some errors and some trends in financial reporting and that in turn shapes some of our guidance material, some of the other activities we undertake, like this webinar for example, um, to improve the quality and accuracy of, of charities' financial reporting. Now, we have, there we go, that's the latest uh, report there, isn't it, John? Uh, yeah, that's right, Chris. So each year um, we publish a report on our findings um, from the annual reviews of the charity financial reports uh, on our website. So you can actually view earlier years um, reports too, if you're interested. Oh yes, that's right, of um, course, yes. Yeah, uh, the, the most recent one was published uh, in March this year, and you can read it using the link uh, that you've displayed on the screen there. So uh, each year, um, you know, we have a, a specific focus. Uh, we're looking for particular issues in our reviews. Um, so for the most recent uh, review, um, some of the main things that we were focusing on were, first of all, confirming that charities provided a complete set of financial statements, which we already talked about, we talked about earlier. Um, also that there was a signed audit or review report attached and a signed responsible person's declaration. Uh, we also had a look to see whether charities had made errors transposing the information from their financial reports into the financial section of the annual information statement, uh, as well as making sure that the financial reports included specific disclosures uh, as required by the Australian accounting standards. And we also took a bit of a look um, at, at disclosures of government revenue in financial reports, uh, which is relevant to some, uh, some other guidance we've released recently we'll, that I'll talk about yeah. a bit later. We, what were some of the, the learnings that came from this, John? What were, I guess, some of the takeaways that, that charities with us today and charities in general can, can, I guess, grab and run with so they can avoid errors and they can look to ensure that their financial reporting is, um, is, is correct and, and on the mark? Okay, well, uh, the most recent review of the 2019 charity financial reports we looked at um, we saw, we did see a few issues coming up. Uh, for example, some charities uh, didn't include all of the required financial statements in their financial report. In particular, 
um, sometimes the statement of cash flows and the statement of changes in equity were missing. Uh, we also saw a small minority of charities uh, that had failed to submit an auditor's or reviewer's report. Uh, some charities didn't include an appropriate responsible person's declaration with their financial report. Uh, as far as disclosures go, um, we did see some charities not including all um, of the disclosures we expected to see that are required by the accounting standards. One example would be uh, disclosures about related party transactions. Can I, can I just and jump in there for a second, John? We, we no. mentioned the term related party here. Um, are you able to just give a perhaps a very quick definition? It's one that I know that a number of charities look at the words related party transaction and go, hold on, what's that? What is a related party? What is a related party transaction? Uh, okay, Chris. Well, um, the, the the general idea of a related a related party transaction is uh, first of all the concept of related party. A related party is, um, an, uh, for example, another organisation um, that has some um, connection uh, yeah. to the charity. So a related party. First and foremost is someone connected to the charity mm -hmm. um, who has um, control or joint control of the of the charity, um, mm -hmm. or might be someone who has significant uh, influence or control over the charity. And a related party transaction would be something like a transfer of resources or services between a charity and a related party. For example, uh, a company that uh, has a director who's also a board member of the charity. Okay. And w when we talk about related parties, related party transactions, is it is it fair to say that they may be, th this, this sort of wanders into the area of, of concepts like conflicts of interest and that sort of stuff? Is that fair to say? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. So um, it, it's not necessarily inappropriate for there to be a related party transaction. For, um, but um, it needs to be clear um, that yeah. any conflicts of interest are being managed. Um, for example, the, the board member who is a, who, who's involved with another, um, you know, who's involved may need to step aside from decision making in relation to those transactions. Yeah, so the old, the old, and I know that we had a webinar a couple of m months back on uh, conflicts of interest. So the the whole idea of transparency and accountability, de declaring these things, uh, ensuring that processes are followed and all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, sorry, I've, I've sidetracked you, John. <laughs> there was, there was one more point that you were looking to make uh, in regards to the lessons learned. Yeah, I think, I'd, I mean, I would just mention that um, there's a fair bit of guidance on the ACNC website on the topic. So if, yeah. if you're not sure what a related party is, what a related party, dis, uh, dis, uh, related party transaction is, check out our website. Okay, now the, the only other um, uh, issue that I was going to mention is that there are some, for, for some charities that are approved to report as a group. Uh, so they, uh, you know, there's a group of charities reporting on a single a annual information statement. There are special conditions of, uh, for those charities. And we did see that in some cases, those group reporting conditions weren't complied with. Yeah. Now these, these I guess, points of concern, if you if you want to call them that, um, they're, they're what we've noticed in in the review. Um, there are also, it goes without saying, but we'll say it anyway. There are a, many areas where charities financial reporting has really improved, and and the uh, the numbers and the improvements have been marked over the the times where we've run the review over over preceding years. Um, and that's really, really positive. But even so, the message is pretty clear that charities still definitely need to be careful um, and to ensure that they're meeting all of the ACNC's requirements when they prepare their, their annual financial reports. Um, again, and we'll refer to some links here on the, on the site, we have all manner of tools and guidance uh, to help charities. Uh, one of them is, um, the ACNC's annual financial uh, report checklist. Now that takes charities in a step-by-step -step way through the requirements. Uh, there's where it can be downloaded. We, we 
highly recommend you you download uh, this checklist and, and have a look at it. It is continually sort of updated to ensure that it's up to date and accurate. Um, we've also got a guide uh, that covers uh, disclosures in these reports that are recommended by the ACNC too, haven't we, John? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so the um, the ACNC recently published a best practice guide for charities on financial report disclosures, uh, and the link's up there on the screen. Um, the, the aim of this new guidance is to encourage charities to disclose information about government revenue received by the charities. Uh, this is something that's of great interest to donors, funders, supporters, and the public. So the guidance gives detailed instructions on how the ACNC recommends charities should disclose information about sources of a charity's government revenue, uh, the extent of a charity's economic dependency on government revenue, and funding received from government but not yet recognised as revenue. Okay, um, so we'll definitely go and have a look at that new new um, resource as well, um, and 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 draw the information from it that you that you need. Um, what we'll what we'll do he says looking at his at his uh, at his watch. Um, probably time just to draw a few things together and to um, wrap up uh, with a couple of, of quick tips uh, quick tips to remember which well, we've got here. The first one um, way back at the start of the webinar we emphasised how important record keeping is. Um, our record keeping checklist can help charities out here. Um, so look when you're keeping records, ensure that you're keeping them the right records, you're keeping them in the right way, um, that you're adhering to the requirements. And by doing that, you're going to have those records uh, on hand to help you with your financial reporting. So sort of double double benefits there, I suppose. Uh, second point, the size of charity um, determines whether a charity has to prepare a financial report. Again, while small charities aren't compelled to do so for the most part, the ACNC does recommend that they do. And as we heard earlier on from, from you, John, the, the number of small charities that are doing this is increasing and, and that's wonderful. It's something we recommend. Uh, what are a couple of the other key sort of takeaways here, John? Okay, so I think um, I would certainly recommend uh, that charities review some of the resources we have available on the website. Uh, in particular, have a look at the ACNC's annual financial report checklist because uh, it's, it, it's a step-by-step -step checklist of, uh, of the ACNC requirements and things that charities should be considering when preparing their financial report. Uh, also have a look at the uh, ACNC standards and financial reporting webpage. As we mentioned, there's quite a, quite a lot of FAQs on there, frequently asked questions about accounting standards, especially the new ones. Mm. And uh, finally, the ACNC's Best Practice Disclosure Guide. And finally, uh, don't forget our templates. We've got, uh, as we mentioned before, we've got the Responsible Persons Declaration template, and we've actually got review and audit report templates. So they're full templates uh, yeah. for the reviewer or the auditor to use when, when um, preparing the audit report or the reviewer's report. Yeah, so look, if you want to... I was, I was going to say, if if you need them, please download them and, and please make use of the resources on, on the site. Um, we've just about reached the end of the end of our formal presentation today, um, and we're getting close to our hour. So we'll not linger too long here on this slide or, or questions. Um, again, just a reminder: we're recording this webinar recording the presentation slides, they're going to be available on our website. Um, we're also going to send out an email to everyone who registered uh, with some important links, some of the links you've seen here, some of the links that have been sent through during the webinar as well, um, some of the references uh, as well as the link to the recording. Um, we did have one point um, that came up, has come up throughout today as we've been speaking, but also came up as a point or a question that was uh, raised by a few people um, as they registered for, for this webinar. Um, and it's one that I guess is, is of probably some level of real general importance here and, and um, maybe John wishes to speak about it. I, I know I'd probably emphasise it too. The, the role of the 
the committee of, of responsible persons, I guess, in understanding finances, um, uh, especially in understanding, or at least having the, the gist of uh, some of the new accounting standards and the accounting standards under which these reports need to be prepared. Um, John, would it be fair and reasonable to say that the idea of um, the responsible persons here, they do have to have some you know, good, decent awareness of the conditions under which and the and the standards uh, that overarch the preparation of financial reports, uh, don't they? That's right, Chris, and I think I think that's really illustrated um, by the uh, the fact that charities have to submit that responsible persons declaration. So there is an expectation um, that. Um, the responsible persons of the charity have reviewed the um, financial reports, uh, the charity's financial report, and that they uh, and uh, determine whether or not um, the uh, the financial report meets the ACNC requirements. And just as importantly, as I mentioned earlier, that the charity is solvent. So that the the uh, the charity's responsible persons are expected to to be involved in making that assessment. Yeah, and. Um, obviously, I guess there are ways and means for responsible people to to do this. Um, one of them, I'm, I'm guessing, would be f the the simple sort of discussion and approval of, you know, financial statements and and those sorts of things uh, at a at a a meeting, be it a a, a, a a normal meeting or even at an AGM. Would that would that be correct? Well, it'll depend. Um, a lot of it will depend on the size of the charity. A, a larger charity may well actually have an, um, a, a separate audit committee um, that actually looks very closely at these issues, um, yeah. or it may be the, the board as a whole that looks at it. Um, but um, the I think generally um, the audit would already be completed before the financial reports are presented to the annual general meeting, and and often. Um, there'll be a requirement in the charity's rules that the auditor um, does attend or is allowed to attend the AGM as well, either to answer questions or to, to discuss issues. Okay, okay. Um, look, you know, that was one that, that, like I said, had come up a little bit in some of the questions before this webinar and has, has come up throughout as well. So um, important to emphasise the, the role and, and the importance that responsible persons, responsible people have in this process to ensure that things are done right, to, to use a phrase, but also to ensure that there is proper oversight uh, and knowledge about what's being put forward um, in, in, and presented in, in these reports. Um, look, what we'll do now, we'll probably, we'll bring things to, to a conclusion. Um, again, um, thank you for, for uh, joining us today. Thank you for registering. Thank you for attending and, and asking questions. Um, here's some of the ways you can stay in touch with us um, through our website, uh, webinars, podcasts, uh, charitable purpose, all that sort of stuff. Um, thanks uh, to John uh, for joining us today. Thank you, John. Uh, no problem at all, Chris. Thank you. Um, and thank you to to Eric um, and to Matt and to Kat to uh, for all their work behind the scenes um, answering questions and queries and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, again, as it says here, if you want to look at previous webinars or register for future ones, um, visit our webinars page. And again, if there's any questions or comments or feedback, there's the email address for you. Thank you very much again, and we will let you go. It's almost lunchtime here, and it might be almost morning tea time elsewhere. <laughs> um, have a great day and enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much. Bye.